Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources, and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. Last week, we left our listeners kind of hanging in mystery about, ooh, why did did we have to end that chapter talking about love and the heart of men and women? What is it that we need to address? Why do you think this next chapter is so important, Sam? Yeah, we struck upon this organically as we were trying to answer these questions. We realized that we were wading deeper and deeper into these waters that needed something else, that needed a a deeper answer, that needed a whole other thing spoken to. And the issue of identity and how we see ourselves and how we're walking well in self-perception in the way that we carry ourselves, all of that, that's huge. Huge. And completely affects how we relate to women. One doesn't exist without the other. Right. So welcome back, friends. John and Sam Eldridge reading from our book, Killing Lions, this week, Chapter 4, on the issue of identity. Chapter 4, Changing the Scripts We Live By. And what business is it of yours if I'm only a girl? You're probably only a boy, a rude, common little boy, a slave, probably, who's stolen his master's horse. Why don't you say it at once that you think I'm not good enough for you, said Shasta. C.S. Lewis, The Horse and His Boy. I chose the college I attended. I recognized that I alone reap the harvest I sowed there, and it was a mixed bag. After attending a public high school, the transition into a Christian college was as much of a culture shock for me as the kids who did it the other way around. I knew I wanted to take a closer look at my faith, and man, the campus was gorgeous. But I had a very hard time adjusting to the culture. It felt like being dropped into Oz. Despite signing a contract to abide by communal standards, a nice euphemism for joy-crushing rules, I was busted for smoking my pipe on campus. I was caught several times sneaking in to the end of mandatory chapel trying to turn in an attendance card after doing a loop through the crowd and leaving through a different door. I wrote an angry essay that was supposed to be praising Christian feminism, but instead focused on how forcing us to praise a viewpoint that might not be our own was troublesome. I pushed for egalitarianism or something more like that. I got a B for straying off topic. I danced. I drank. If the day was especially nice, I skipped class and went to the beach. You don't need to be particularly insightful to see it coming. I ran into problems. I soon encountered the motivational stick this college favors. Shame. Academic shame was used by professors or fellow students for poor performance, or really anything less than exemplary performance. My school was a gathering place for valedictorians, it seemed. Spiritual shame was enforced by the Christian community with upturned noses, or worse, the earnest approach by a spiritual leader offering counsel. Do you think this is the Christian thing to do, Sam? Is this what Jesus would do? Ugh. Funny thing is, I resented them for treating me the way I taught them to see me. A phrase I often heard throughout my time at school was, Oh Sam, you're such a lovable screw-up. I was charming, so people wouldn't stay mad or disappointed with me for long. But I knew that, and I knew that they thought I was as much of a joke as I felt, so I kept on behaving that way. Whatever the form, I began to feel hedged in by shame, disappointment, and disapproval. When enough people tell you that you are a certain way, you start believing it. I did write at school, but only during my final three semesters there, and even then I wrote and co-edited a page of the student newspaper that was a sarcastic, humorous, rebellious page. Now, I love being a rebel. That fighting spirit is in me for good reasons. But the rebelliousness of that page was not fueled by noble aspirations. I wrote out of the identity I had been given, and I was angry for much of it, which led to a lot of conceited and biting work that I am not completely proud of. By the time I graduated, I was pretty sure I didn't have a future in writing, despite the fact that it remained a dream to do so. Identity is like the turning of the earth. You never really notice that it's carrying you along, but on any given moment, you are actually hurling forward at 1,040 miles an hour. This is one powerful force. We can't live beyond the way we see ourselves. When our world hands us a script... When we find ourselves repeatedly cast into a certain role, it requires almost superhuman strength to defy the gravitational pull of it. Those scripts come upon us from many circles, family, 
friends, a coach, a church, our culture. I never really worried about the other stuff, what the community would have called acting out or your rebellious phase. I knew it was your way of handling the religious suffocation, and frankly, it's healthier than marching in line, letting legalism pull you under its false views of God and the Christian life. Jesus wasn't exactly a big cheering fan of the religious. But the cumulative effects of shame broke my heart because I knew that despite your strength, it would wear away at you. It wears away at all of us. The Scots pastor John Watson said, Be kind, for every man is fighting a hard battle. This was yours, the battle for your heart, the battle to hang on to Jesus while throwing the religious out the second-story window, the battle to push through the criticism and hold true to your desires to write, the battle to cling to one of life's most important truths, that the heart is and always will be central, the powerhouse of life within us. Above all else, the wisest man in history warned, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Proverbs 4.23 I imagine this is true for most universities, but this particular college really idolized the mind. I had many dear friends who found validation in academic performance, which then became pressure to perform again and again. It was a vortex that the best fell into and few could climb out of. No one was there to tell them their heart mattered. No one knew to. So it should come as no surprise that in lieu of cultivating a heart that was alive and cared for, the mind reigned all-powerful, all-important, and all-consuming. I was shocked when the powers above appointed me as an RA during my senior year. But I did have a gift with people, and I felt I could really help younger guys entering the system because of all I had experienced. I told my superiors that when it came down to my residence, their hearts mattered more to me than upholding the letter of the law. I probably didn't need to announce this, but I knew what I wanted to be about. As counterculture as it was, I believed I'd develop deeper relationships with my men than those RAs who couldn't see past their role as rule enforcer. And the hearts of those young men needed some serious tending to. One guy was so passionate. He loved the church he was in, loved the people around him, and threw himself into that world. The sad thing is, he kept getting into tough places relationally over and over again. Somewhere inside him, there's a lot of anger and a broken tape in his head playing something like, you aren't worth much, which has played into how he relates to people and spends his time. It destroyed a lot of friendships and burned a lot of bridges, unfortunately. Another guy was the life of the party, a ton of fun to be around and gifted with that social awareness that made everything he did seem cool. One time we were out for coffee and he shared just how much pain and sadness he was living with, how his family had been torn apart by the death of his brother when he was younger, how he felt like no one knew him or cared to ask. His facade of joviality and playfulness was his mechanism to cope with his true belief in a horrible world filled with grief. So what if they had great GPAs? Their lives were tragic. You simply cannot neglect the heart and get away with it. The mind is a beautiful instrument, one we certainly want to develop all our lives, and not only in the college years. But God gave us the mind to protect the heart, not usurp it. As Walker Percy said, you can get all A's and still flunk life. So let's think about identity and the heart for a moment. All men, young or old, have within us a famished craving for validation. It will not be denied. We will chase validation wherever we can, and we learn pretty quickly what our world rewards, what it shames, what it cares nothing about. So the athletes seek validation by being fast, strong, winning, while the valedictorians throw themselves into papers, exams, and maintaining their GPA. The spiritual leader latches onto the praise coming from their gifting, and they give their heart and soul over to that dance while the cool kids go barefoot and wear dreadlocks. We're all looking for the same thing. When a young man doesn't know who he is and what he's made of, resisting those scripts that are being handed out is about the same as defying gravity. Let's see, I gotta do my laundry, move my car, and oh yeah, I think I'll fly today. Despite my love for the theater, I gave it up completely and entered the corporate world in my 20s, largely because I didn't think I could make it in the big leagues of professional theater. I was good, but was I good enough? I yearned for the approval of the older men in the company I was working for, 
And the more they rewarded my achievements, the more I gave myself over to the corporate carousel. Brooks Brothers shirts, Toomey briefcases, the whole shebang. Not that there's anything wrong with wanting a life in that world so long as it is your calling. For me, it was almost entirely based on a false self. I was simply living for what others approved of, famished for masculine validation. But the false self, even when it's built upon some part of our genuine gifting, will never, ever settle the issue inside. The horrible thing about chasing validation through money or work or women is that you can never let down. You have to keep pedaling for fear of falling off. And yet, here you are, taking an enormous risk, taking up the pen again to put your writing out there for all the world to see. How do you explain that? I feel like I'm still in the midst of it. When I first graduated, I was lost. Of course, many graduates feel lost, but I had no idea where to go next. I wasn't confident as a writer, which is what I had been driving toward those four years. So I asked a couple of guys to help me pray for guidance. Nothing was meant to be that easy, it seemed. After months of spiritual static, only two possibilities were left on the table. God simply isn't going to give me the plan, which is where I landed, or God wants to speak to a different question. Choosing the optimistic path, that God does speak and hasn't left me out in the cold, my friends asked God what he was trying to speak to in my life. This time he answered immediately, my identity. My friends felt, and rightly so, that God was after how I saw myself. After pushing through the disappointment that God wasn't going to give me a roadmap for the next few years of my life, I asked where this was going. Their question, well, how do you see yourself, Sam? That's easy, I thought. I am a screw-up, a black sheep, an outcast. At best, I am Jack Kerouac's Dharma bum, a wanderer who can't fit into the world. Looking for answers, being reckless and misunderstood with nowhere in particular to go and nothing in particular to accomplish. Sounds emo to me now, but I had completely bought into it. Was thinking about just traveling abroad for a couple of years in an aimless, adventuring way, like the Dharma bum. Lost, but looking so cool. I was living out of the identity I'd been handed in college. Okay, I see it. What now? I asked. We prayed and asked God what he thought of me and one of my friends got wide-eyed and started talking about The Horse and His Boy by C.S. Lewis. That was you. You are Shasta. It took me a minute to piece together what was being implied. In that great story, the protagonist is a boy named Shasta. He has run away from the cruel fisherman who raised him, and somewhere along his journey, Shasta, along with the talking horse he rides, crosses paths with Erebus, a girl from a noble house. Shasta's life has been ruled by shame, So when Erevis continually refers to him as someone low, a commoner, an outcast, he has a hard time fighting it. But at the end of the book, it is revealed that Shasta is a long-lost prince of a great kingdom. Well, I hope the connection is as obvious as it was to my friend. Erevis was the voice of my peers, the voice of my college that told me over and over again that I was as low as I felt sometimes. Then we prayed and asked God to tell me who I am in his eyes. You are my son and a true king. I simply sat there, not sure what to do with it all. Which one do you want to be true, Sam? My other friend asked. Do you want to be the Dharma bum or a king? It was obvious that I had a decision to make. Accept the new identity or stay in shame. I couldn't and wouldn't go back to feeling like that. If the lies Shasta had been living with were the same I lived with, and once broken there was a kingdom of our own to be had, the choice was simple. We prayed. I renounced shame and the agreements I had made with outcasts and black sheep. Choosing the new identity enabled me to begin moving strongly toward a girl named Susie and toward writing. I cut drinking down to a nominal amount. Instead, I spent my time running, the effect of which was losing 30 pounds over the next year. I moved away from a town that, as much as a place can, had come to define me, as much as the peers whom I resented. You offered me an opportunity to write together in a project that might turn into a book, But I wasn't so sure yet. I wanted to do something on my own, but more than that, I hated the kids in college who never worked for anything, the ones who joined their father's company when they graduated without ever working for someone else. Those people sucked, in my opinion. They never struggled, so they never grew. Six months later, I'm on a road trip through Malaysia when God snuck up on me again. Out of the blue, our host, David, began to ask me those, what are you going to do with your life, questions. I talked about wanting to do something meaningful and how much I enjoyed writing. 
the exact same themes came up again. How living in shame doesn't do the world any good at all. How God had a nobler role for me, and if I would accept it, I could move with strength and courage into a life of purpose. With his eyes focused on the road, after having to swerve to avoid a dead monkey, yes, a monkey, he said to me, Sam, you are a king. These gifts you have were given to you to do good. How is it noble for the man in the parable who is given talents to set those aside? I was speechless. I felt like a replay of what God had been saying to me months before. I realized I had been playing it safe, hanging back in the old script. It was time to accept the new one. So here I am, and here I write. I love it. This is one of those breakthrough moments every man needs. Busting free of the shame and the false self, accepting a new identity, our true self, and stepping forward in courage to live from it. I'm thinking of all those stories where the young man needs to come to terms with his true identity. In the film version of the Tolkien classic, The Return of the King, Aragorn is a great man, but he's been acting a bit like the lone wanderer, sort of a Dharma bum. The turning point for him comes when Elrond brings him the sword of the king and declares, put aside the ranger, become who you were born to be. The line is repeated almost verbatim in the trailer for the Russell Crowe version of Robin Hood. He too has been living on the edges of life when he is confronted with the question, are you ready to be who you are? By the way, this is the secret behind the multi-billion dollar video game industry. Halo, Assassin's Creed, Fable, young men get lost in those role-playing games for days because they soothe the validation ache inside. While you're in that world, you feel powerful. You are the hero. Your brother Luke was just playing Reckoning. He was a sword-wielding champion, and at that moment, facing two enormous ogres with war hammers. Yikes, I said, those guys are powerful. Luke's response as he brought them down, but I'm powerful too. All these stories reverberate and resound deep inside us because they are echoes of the gospel. God finds men, renames them, and calls them up into great roles. Gideon was hiding in an empty well when God addressed him as a mighty warrior. Peter didn't exactly have a high view of himself, but Jesus called him a rock. Their peers thought James and John were knuckleheads. Jesus called them sons of thunder. This is the critical moment in any young man's life. We must hear who we really are, receive genuine validation, so that, like you and Shasta, we can tear up the other scripts we've been handed. I know so many of us long for words of validation, but few ever hear them. An acquaintance of mine who lived down the street went out and bought a new car one day. He spent quite a bit of money and took out a loan to boot. When he pulled up and started dancing around the driveway chanting, I own a car, now I am a man. I own a car, now I am a man. I wish I were kidding. It felt pretty hollow at the time. I knew he was getting his validation from owning things. But it's something that society has told him marks the way to adulthood. More like killing a dandelion, isn't it? But in the absence of validation from God, we'll take whatever scraps come our way. First, we must come to terms with how we've been seeing ourselves, the role we have been playing, like lovable screw-up. This can be a painful awakening, admitting how we've been rewarded, what we have been shamed for, and how we have given ourselves over to all that. Patton was a very effective tank commander in World War II, but the accolades consumed him. As the war was drawing to a close, Eisenhower wanted to dismiss the arrogant general, because of his constant, outrageous comments that made the press. Patton practically groveled and begged not to be relieved of his command. He couldn't let it go, couldn't separate himself from the one role where he won acclaim. Apart from famous general, he was a hollow man. I published Wild at Heart in 2001. It became a pretty big success and did a lot of good for men and women but my subsequent books were not nearly as popular, even though I threw my heart and soul into them. It was a real test. How would I handle a disappointing reception? I had to disentangle my self-worth from what people thought of my writing. It was messy, and trust me, I had my bad days. But if my identity was built on successful author, I think I would have simply quit, slipped off quietly, and pouted. 
This can be a very revealing experience. How do we handle defeat? Because for men, it sure raises the issue of validation. If you are the compulsive student, can you take a B in a class? Athletes and competitive types, can you lose, be ignored? Can you let go of the essential parts of your wardrobe? Lose the jersey, the bro hat, the hipster look, the sports coat, the dreadlocks. A man whose identity flows out of deep validation doesn't wilt under criticism. He enjoys applause when it comes, but frankly, isn't desperate for it. He can walk away from work at five o'clock. He doesn't measure his success by how much money he makes. We grow into this man, to be sure. I'm not setting a new standard of perfection, but what I'm describing is not out of reach, not for any man. We must ask God what He thinks of us. That famished craving for love and validation must be spoken to in a defining way, like He did for you. This is one of the places where Christianity really shines. God steps into the picture to help set us on a firmer foundation than the scripts we've bought into. He tells us to put off the old man and put on the new. He calls us His sons. He assures us we are deeply loved and chosen. Let those facts sink into your heart, and it will set you free. Really, spend a single day holding on to, "I am a son of the living God. I am chosen. I am deeply loved." You will feel things shifting deep inside. This sounds so simple, but it will revolutionize your life. Ask God for validation as a man. I can't overstate how important this is. What He brings in response will surprise and settle you. Sometimes it comes in loving words straight from your heavenly Father. Oftentimes it comes through experiences that at first feel like hassles or fearful challenges, but in fact will prove deeply validating if we accept the lions we need to face. Earlier this spring, I got a call from some neighbors who needed help trailering some horses. Now, as you know, despite my childhood dreams, I am not a cowboy. I have only trailered horses a couple of times in my life. But these folks were in a tight spot and needed help, and so I jumped in. Turns out they owned some very large, very anxious horses that hadn't been moved by trailer for who knows how long. It was a scary experience. I pushed through the fear, used what little skill I had, and five times that in prayer, and got those horses in my trailer and over to the new stables. A simple act, but it was for me deeply validating. I can handle it. Do you feel that you can handle life, a woman, your finances, crisis when it hits? I can handle this. Is the practical daily expression of a validated man. Bit by bit, it's happening. Last summer, Susie and I had the opportunity to climb Mount Whitney, the tallest peak in the lower forty-eight, with some friends who had been planning on it for some time. We weren't sure we'd be able to go since all the spots were filled, so we didn't really train for it. Then two days before the climb, the call came that two spots had opened up. I was jittery to say the least. I felt like the low man on the totem pole, the one who didn't train, who was the least athletic, or so I felt, and I dreaded the coming weekend. Shame was crouching at the door. You're going to wimp out. You can't handle this. You won't be able to summit. When the climb actually came, the group decided to do the whole thing in one day, starting at base camp at 4 a.m. We would summit by early afternoon and be back down in time for dinner. Six hours into the climb, we asked the group coming down if we were doing well, if we were getting close. They laughed at us. We had four hours to go. After ten grueling hours, I was the first to summit. My group had been afflicted with altitude sickness, fatigue, and disorientation. By the end, I was the only one who felt good enough to keep walking around on top. In fact, Susie and our friend Ryan both fell asleep immediately. At the end of the day, I felt so validated, so strong. I had surprised myself and the members of our group by leading the way to the top. Jackpot! This is why almost all initiation rituals handed down for centuries involved physical trials for young men. After finishing their training in a secret valley, the young warriors of Kauai had to swim home miles in the open ocean. Sioux braves spent nights out on the mountain alone. For centuries, the Maasai killed lions. Our elders knew that men learn by doing. It's one thing to be told you possess a genuine strength, but another thing altogether to discover for yourself that you do. 
This is why hard work is so important for young men. If your friend could see his work in hell, not as failure, not as a prison sentence, but as his lion to slay, he could come at it with a whole new perspective. Even if he only sticks it out for another six months, he can walk away with blood on his hands and the sense of, I did that. I won. I can handle it. Our starting place is to ask God what he thinks of us, to allow our Father to speak to us as sons. And then from there, we begin to get active in the process of seeking and receiving identity and validation. God always treats a man like a man. He honors our involvement. He invites our participation. Get active in the process. Where do you feel weak? Where do you need some shoring up? Killing lions is all about finding validation through genuine victories fought out of our true heart, from which we emerge with a genuine strength and a sense of self. When you know you've accomplished that, it settles some important questions deep inside and allows you to move into your world with courage. The most fearsome lions will always be the ones that roar with the sound of our historic shame, trying to cower us back into the false self, back into the script we were handed, not by God, but by the world, and ultimately by the evil one. Climbing Whitney was a great experience in taking a risk, a risk that ended up validating me in a time when I really needed it. But it was a process to get there. I had to have the courage to step up and attempt the climb. I needed to stick with it hour after hour. Getting to the top and back down proved to be a series of trials instead of one simple hurdle to overcome. Maybe it's the process, the recurring demand to overcome again and again that so many balk at. I'm not just talking about Mount Whitney. Thinking back on it, I realized that it has almost always been at the end of a process when I received validation. When I turned 14 and ended my vision quest year by climbing the Grand Teton, you and the men of the community spoke words of affirmation over me. It meant so much to me that I had to keep myself from bursting into tears. The relationships I built with my residents as an RA were a testament to the year we had spent together. When I was commended for an article I wrote for the newspaper, one that took time, and the time spent fixing a bunch of uncommendable articles I had to work through. The RA initiation backpacking trip when I led the team up a hazardous pass. The friendships forged through long nights on the beach and tears in the privacy of our rooms. The times I have felt validated seem to repeat two themes, courage and process. The strength it took to push through the fear and the stamina to fight it through to the end. That is what made it validating. And that's why we must reframe the decade of the 20s in a young man's life. This is the time for courage and process, the season of the warrior, a time for accepting the journey into masculine initiation. We reframe everything by one simple choice. I am accepting God's invitation to become a man. From there, we interpret jobs, money, relationships, flat tires, bad dates, even our playtime as the context in which the boy is becoming a man. We take an active role, asking our Father to speak to us, speak to our identity, to validate us. We step into our fears and accept hardship as discipline, Hebrews 12, 7. As we do, an inner strength grows within us, which will change everything when it comes to pursuing a woman. Yeah, this is one of my favorite chapters. It's a doozy. It's huge. It's huge. powerful to walk through and experience and then get to relive through the writing process. But changing and understanding the way that you engage yourself and the world and your heart and how God sees you and tackling issues of identity, this could be a book in and of itself. We love this chapter. It really could have. So hope you're loving it too. You're listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast and John and Sam Eldridge reading from our new book, Killing Lions, A Guide to the Trials That Young Men Face, a book that is powerful for young men. But I just want to add for moms, dads who have young men in their life or raising sons and they're soon going to become young men and want to know what to speak into. And for those of you that have young men in your world that you love, oh my goodness, tell them about this. Tell them about the Killing Lions films that are available on killinglions.com. 